everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and today I want to do the first impressions video of the Google Nexus 5. Lately I've been doing a format where I like to start with an unboxing video. During that time I ask you to ask all the questions that you can think of that you want to know about this device. That way I can start to really think about those in terms of the full review. And then after a couple of days of playing with the device, I like to do a first impressions video, which is more or less like a mini review. And then after a couple of weeks of playing around with the device, discovering really what it's about, the good points, and also the bad points, I like to do the full in-depth review, which is time-coded so that you can jump from topic to topic. So now that I've had a couple of days to play around with this device, let's go and see how it fares so far. So starting off again with the look and feel of this phone, I really did like the matte finish on here and I still continue to like it, although I'm seeing that it's very easy to muck up with fingerprints. Other people who don't have as moist of fingers have reported that it's actually quite resistant to fingerprints, but I think that's just going to depend on your individual hands. Luckily though, it's quite easy to clean off and to keep clean. And definitely this matte finish on these sides with the black version is quite quite nice, especially in regards to fingerprints as I'm seeing that people are not so happy with the glossy finish because it is so much easier to attract fingerprints and to see them as well. I'm talking about glossy in terms of the white version, which has a white matte back just like the black one, except for the sides are glossy. And on the front of the white one, it's still black just like this black one, but the receiver is white. Now in my unboxing video, I was talking about how this felt a little bit sharp in hand, especially when you squeezed it in your palm. That's because you have a back cover that's simply just meeting the sides, and it seems that the back cover is not mesh with the sides. I did ask a bunch of people kind of in a poll-like fashion, and it seems that this is just the design of the phone. It's not a defect, it's just what it is. So I've kind of been compensating by not squeezing it hard in my palm, and I've been just fine after that. It just takes a little bit of getting used to for me to adjust to a new design. One other thing that I am noticing now is that the camera looks kind of cheap on the back. I don't know if everyone's is like this, but you can see how the glass is cut out here. It doesn't look like it fits perfectly in that chassis, or the glass wasn't cut correctly or something, so I can see it looks a little bit cheap, but hey, what can you expect? The Gorilla Glass 3 has been holding up really well so far. I haven't been using screen protectors on Gorilla Glass 3. I didn't have any trouble with my Galaxy S4 getting scratches. It's not impossible, but I'm seeing that these newer generations of Gorilla Glass have been doing quite well, so I doubt I will ever put a screen protector on this thing. Of course, though, don't expect Gorilla Glass 3 to do much for you if you're going to be dropping this phone. It's still brittle. Just because it has better native damage resistance does not mean that if you drop this guy that it's not going to break just like any other version of Gorilla Glass, honestly. I saw a drop test from Android Authority, and as soon as the thing dropped on its face, the glass chipped away and it actually reveals the circuit board underneath. So if you're somebody who's very clumsy, I would probably put a case on this guy, just like any other phone. This phone does feel sturdy though, there is no creaking, it does not feel cheap to me. It's also very light in the hand. So even though this isn't the most pretty design that I have seen on a phone, I really do like how this feels, except for the palmability. Now, taking a look around the phone and also getting into specifications. A lot of reviewers have erroneously said that this is stereo speakers. It's not. This is not stereo speakers. When you think about an iPhone, what do you see on the bottom? You see the exact same thing, where there's a grill on one side and a grill on the other. Except for this is your speaker, just like the iPhone, and then you have a microphone. So, on the left is the speaker, on the right-hand side is the microphone. Yes, I am positive. People have asked me this over and over again, and to check. I've checked it several times, and I'll show you. So, left. You can see that it's obstructing the sound, and there's nothing coming out of the right. Let's go ahead and lift. So now, covering the right, and nothing happens. So, point taken. This is the microphone, and this is the speaker. Then, of course, you've got your micro USB port on the bottom, also a charging port. I found out that this phone charges very quickly. I've been using my Galaxy S4 2 amp charger, and it charges up very quickly. I'll be doing more tests to see just how fast that is, but when I talk about battery in a few minutes, you'll see why this is an important thing. In the box, they've only given us 1.2 amp charger, which is a little bit annoying because it does a lot better at 2 amps. And as long as your battery is not getting really hot while it's charging, it does just fine. And in my experience so far, using a 2 amp charger works great. 
On the right hand side we have a power button, we also have a micro sim slot. Now a lot of people have been asking about which version of the phone should I get and some people don't even realize that there are two different versions of the phone. There seems to be a version for North America which has LTE bands for the North American market and then there's one for a broad European bands, European LTE bands. So don't expect to buy an American version and it to work on the LTE bands somewhere like in France or somewhere like in the United Kingdom. And if you have a European Nexus 4, don't expect to bring it over to the United States and to use the LTE bands here. There still is quite a bit of fragmentation as far as LTE bands go, but if you just want to use 3G, it doesn't matter if you get the European model or the United States model, those bands should coincide for 3G just fine. On the top we have a microphone, we've also got a standard headphone jack, on the left hand side we have a volume rocker. Now all the buttons are pretty clicky, I haven't had much trouble with them, although they feel a little bit sharp, I would have liked if they were more or less rounded just a bit. The same thing goes for the power button, but can't really complain, they're very clicky and they're very responsive. Then on the front we have a proximity sensor followed by our receiver which is white on the white version although like I mentioned the front is still black and then we have a 1.3 megapixel front facing camera. On the back side we have an 8 megapixel sensor like the iPhone 5, it's not 13 megapixel like all the other flagship phones right now. Nice thing though is that it is optical image stabilized. So that really helps with protecting against motion blur. I've had a chance to take a couple of shots. I'm going to give you the link down in the description to my Google Plus where I have taken shots with the iPhone 5S and also with the Nexus 5 to compare back and forth how they look. It seems like when you are taking pictures with the Nexus 5, it tends to boost the exposure a little bit higher than it should be. So some of the pictures seem to be a little bit washed out. I'm going to continue testing this and taking pictures. The pictures are actually fairly decent and the video is as well. It's not perfect. I can't say that this is the best camera on a smartphone by any means, but I am hoping for some updates by Google. We'll see what happens. In general though, the pictures don't have a very good dynamic range. I'm also noticing that while taking pictures, anytime there are whites or there's sky, it tends to really burn images. Skies and whites seem to be blown out or burned. And in general, I'm just seeing a lot of varying results although this camera is not bad. In terms of specifications, this guy has all the newest processors like the other phones out like the Galaxy Note 3 and the LG G2. So it's pretty awesome for the money and what you can get here with that money. So Snapdragon S800 SoC, 4 crate 400 cores, running at 2.3 gigahertz, although it's technically 2.26 gigahertz measured speed, and the Adreno 330 GPU. I'm really curious about thermal throttling with this phone. That's another thing that I'm going to check into. I want to see if the GPU throttles, that was something that was really violent with the Nexus 4. When the Nexus 4 got to be about 39 degrees Celsius, I saw that the frequency of the GPU dropped by half. So during gameplay, especially fast moving games, Need for Speed, I could see that instead of running at about 30 frames per second, it would be down at 15 frames per second, and it would be very poor in terms of gameplay. So I'm gonna have to see what goes on with the thermal throttling here, see what I can discover. Maybe some of you can give me some feedback, what you've noticed thus far. I haven't had a chance just yet to completely kill this thing as this is just a first impressions video, but at least I'm noticing with what I have played with so far that when this guy gets hot, it's not getting blisteringly hot like the Galaxy S4. So I wouldn't say that this is a phone that gets incredibly hot, thankfully. Turning on the display, first thing I want to call attention to is brightness. This display gets very bright. Unfortunately, auto brightness seems to be too high for what it's supposed to be. That's one of the complaints that I am seeing is that when you have auto brightness on, it's a little bit higher than it should be for particular environments. So getting into the display, this is quite a bright display. For mine, I measured over 500 nits. Some other ones I'm seeing are around 500 nits. I've also got some preliminary measurements in. Also, my boyfriend Francois was able to do some measurements as well on his Nexus 5. He's got a European Nexus 5 and I'm able to see that the calibration and what they are aiming for is constant throughout the models. So it looks like they should all have about the same behavior. Now this device is an LG device and a lot of people are familiar with the LG G2. When looking at the LG G2 display, it's a lot more cooler in temperature, meaning the whites, instead of being a neutral temperature, are very much blue. And also the LG G2 has a lot more saturated colors than this. Some people are going to like that, some people won't. But what I can say here with the saturations is that this one is actually more accurate because what LG tried to do with the LG G2 was they tried to oversaturate to get the panel to look more or less like an AMOLED display, trying to compete there with Samsung. 
but Google definitely tried to have this calibrated so it looked more natural. I want to show you some measurements. I can also show you what the G2 looked like in terms of measurements. Now to start off with, I don't want to go into huge depth here until I get to the full review, but basically what we are seeing here is that the display on the Nexus 5 displays a nice range of colors, especially in comparison to all the other flagships out on the market. This CIE diagram also shows what's going on with the saturations. I mentioned that Google tried to make this look as natural as possible, so the spacing of these colored dots is all right. They should be in a straight line and evenly spaced. You end up with problems when they're not in a straight line and when also they're not evenly spaced. For example, when looking at the G2, I did measure with less dots. What we have here is five dots total, but you can see that they're really not evenly spaced, especially dots four and five are up towards the maximum saturations. And this is how I know that LG was trying to get their display to look like AMOLED. If you look at green, they're trying to get 75% green to be at the max green, which is really similar to how AMOLED is. So definitely the Nexus 5 looks more natural. Now, while the Nexus 5 is made to look more natural, some people are complaining that it looks just a tad bit washed out. Actually, we can see why that is with gamma. I can see that the gamma for midtones, which really accounts for stuff like skin tones, face tones, is a little bit too low for what it's supposed to be. So when gamma is a little bit too low, you get colors that look too light, too washed out. It's not horrible, but it's a little bit noticeable. I will definitely get more in depth with this with the full review, but this is just giving you an idea of where this display stands for now. It's not a bad display by any means. Five inches is a really nice sweet spot for some, not too big and not too small. And it's got 445 pixels per inch, so it's crazy sharp. Now getting into Android 4.4 KitKat, there are some things that I am actually really liking. In the past, I have completely ignored Google Now, but I'm liking the new integration and I like how easy it is to access. So just from your main screen, if you pan to your left, you are presented with a very fully integrated and very neat Google Now. Neat, meaning tidy and also pretty cool. So whether you are underneath the Google Now page or you are underneath the home screen, all you need to say is, okay, Google, and also here I can say, okay, Google. So that is incredibly easy to bring up and it has no trouble recognizing my voice. I can tell that Google has really worked on voice recognition. I like being able to search anything from right in here. Okay, Google, open up Granny Smith. And you can see it takes a couple of seconds, but I'm able to execute apps from here. So we are presented with a pretty decent universal search from right here, all that can be done by voice, or you can simply just type it in. I'm liking the ease of access to my research topics. That's something that I never paid attention to before. It pays attention to what I'm searching for on the internet. And it shows up underneath my cards and asks me, am I interested in this? I can say yes. Do I want to continue researching this topic? I can say yes as well. So finally, Google Now is something that I actually want to use. Also underneath here we have reminders, which you can type in or do with voice recognition. And you've got several different criteria to customize Google Now. So you can choose sports team stocks, places, you know, common places such as where you live, where you work, and everything else which seems to learn about you over time. I've seen more and more things being added to this list over time, so I'm curious to see the limits of this of course, you have the option to turn Google Now off, but once you do that, it's going to reset everything to default and it has to relearn all the things that you do during your day. So I'm going to keep it on for now, but I am sure this takes a major hit on the battery. So I will see over time for the full review. I'm also really liking how the phone address book works now. I really love the integration with Google and Google Search. So instead of having random contacts all over the place, it groups your contacts by showing you your favorites and also the ones that you use most often. So just say that I call my sister a lot. Her contact is not gonna be down under the B's or the G's. It's going to be right up at the top. So I have found this to be very interesting and I quite like this. And also here you can see it says search contacts and nearby places. So let's say Baskin Robbins. And when I do this, it's going to bring up the closest Baskin Robbins. And if I click on it, it's actually going to call the store. So I love this, this is very, very useful. The launcher is a little bit different now. When you press downward, you're going to be presented with wallpapers, widgets, and settings. The first thing that I was confused about was how in the world do I create another panel? There is no way to actually do that on here. The way to do this is by holding down a widget or an application, and then you need to scroll to your right. 
I've done this, I don't know, 30, 40 times. It seems that I haven't been able to find a limit yet to how many panels I can create. Making it easy on myself, I'm now on the last panel. I have the Google Chrome icon. And now you can see I'm able to create that very last panel to the far right. So look at this, this is insane. You can have panels to your heart's content. If anyone wants to know what this wallpaper is, it's by Dual Boot Games. It's a Christmas live wallpaper. It's quite adorable. Whoop. I don't know why this many home screens are needed, but hey, that's pretty cool that we don't seem to have a limitation as far as I can see. That dot is still staying there. And I've gone like 10 different panels. We've got our classic ability to drag down from the top with one finger and bring over the notification panel. If you use two fingers to swipe downward, you bring up your settings panel. These are your quick toggles. If you go underneath location, we have something that's different. Under here, you see that location mode is on. If I click underneath mode, you're gonna see right now it says high accuracy. High accuracy is the best in terms of location. It uses GPS, Wi-Fi, and also your mobile networks to estimate your location. I've noticed that I can't use the GPS unless this is on. I would call this the equivalent of your GPS mode. Then you've also got battery saving mode, which turns off the GPS. This is what I recommend most of the time unless you are navigating somewhere. And it just uses Wi-Fi and mobile network triangulation to find out where you are. And then you've got device only. So most of the time I recommend keeping it on battery saving. This is just like turning the GPS off and just keeping Wi-Fi and mobile networks on like in the past. And it's less aggressive in terms of battery. I also like how easy it is now to see Google location reporting. This is quite freaky. I remember when I went to France, I had Google location on the entire time and I could literally see myself crossing the ocean and exactly everywhere I was going underneath my Google account settings. Having Google location reporting on all the time just keeps your phone awake and it seems to really drain your battery and it just seems like it's taking away your own privacy. Over a six month period of time, I was able to see exactly where I was. I could see in my house, around my house, where I traveled around my house, every single store I went to and how long I was there. So keep in mind that this is quite freaky. It really low jacks you and records everything that you do and it wastes battery life, so I tend to keep this off. But at least it's honest and very present now. I would always go underneath help and see exactly what this does. I really love how easy they make it to see exactly what this is and even be able to search the internet right on the direct page about this. So I tend to keep this off for all accounts. Another thing that I am noticing with the UI is just how poor the camera application is and still is. Look at this. We have the scene settings of the camera off the page. I can't even access those. It's not even excusable, Google. You should be fixing this. What I've been noticing with this application is that the camera has a little bit of issues focusing. And sometimes when I take pictures, the object I am focusing on is still not even in focus and it's focusing on something else. I think the biggest bane of this poor camera's existence on this phone is the software and not the camera itself. I am so hoping that Google updates this. This is just obnoxious and annoying. You can either touch right here as your menu to access your settings or you can tap downward. And sometimes it doesn't quite work because you're trying to focus at the same time. There you go, you see it actually popped up off the screen again. This is just nonsense. So I recommend using this here. And then it's not intuitive, although right here we have the ability to switch camera, turn on and off flash. You have your other settings, you've got exposure compensation and your HDR setting. Then underneath your video camera, you can hold down and it easily brings it up this time. You can control your white balance setting. You've got your extra settings, front or back camera, and also you can turn on the flash or the video light. And there's not much by way of extra settings. You can just choose your time lapse. You can choose your video quality, which is up to 1080p. So no, we're not seeing 4K on this device. And you can store your location or geotagging. I still think that Google makes the best 360 panorama software or photosphere that we see right here. But please, this is so old school and just looks like a kid made this. A careless kid who didn't put much thought into the UI. Can't wait for an update. Slow to focus, has trouble focusing, and it's just not pleasant to use. Also, I'm noticing that when you are recording, you can tap and it takes a picture for you. But when you tap to take a picture, you can see that the frame rate drops a little bit. So that's something that is expected. That was something that someone asked me. And yes, when you take a picture while you're filming, it does tend to drop frames a little bit. And yes, that camera application is a real battery hog. I can feel that my poor phone is getting a little bit hot. The next thing that I am paying very close attention to so far is battery life. 
What we are looking at here right now is real time. I am at 27%. You can see it's been three hours and 27 minutes on battery. And when looking at the screen on time, it's only at two hours and 20 minutes. This thing isn't gonna last me for more than an hour at the pace that I am using it right now. So this is something that's quite shocking because I'm usually able to get a lot longer. That was something like the LG G2, which had the best battery life. It was 3000 milliamp hours, which this really should have. This is only 2300 milliamp hours. That was a very big mistake I can see. So those extra 700 milliamp hours make a huge difference. So think about this, at this heavy rate, I have a pretty regulated usage by now with all these phones and all this testing. This is probably going to hit four hours of very strenuous use where I can get six to nine hours on other Android phones that have the exact same SOC inside of them. So keep that in mind, battery life is not very good here. And also right now there seems to be a bug. You can see that Android OS is very high up on my list. Mr. Super Curio has called attention to this for me. There seems to be an issue with battery leak when it's idle. It seems that the service that searches for Chromecast is quite rogue right now. And it's something that was happening even before, but it's really affecting this poor guy. So basically, instead of that service shutting down when it should, just say when you have the screen off, when it obviously should not be looking for a Chromecast anymore, it stays on. So we will see what happens with that over time. With where the battery is right now, without applications like ones that turn off the radios and learn your usage to optimize the battery life, I would call this device a nice little toy. But this has certainly not lasted me through the day. Luckily, I am someone who is next to a charger all the time. And because I'm next to a charger and because this charge is so fast, especially when I use a two amp charger, it's not a completely huge downfall. But if you're somebody who needs to use your phone all throughout the day right now, this is probably not the phone for you. Unless you have extra battery banks just sitting around. I'm sure people are going to be creating custom kernels, custom ROMs, all types of things for this that can try to optimize the battery. And hopefully Google will get that Chromecast service fixed. Cause leaving this guy idle overnight, it just kills the battery when it should only be draining 10% at most or even less. So please Google, I really like this phone. I really, really like KitKat. I love having a device that's unlocked. I love being able to customize it to the greatest ability I have. Please don't ruin it with a terrible battery. So I'm going to continue using this for several weeks. I wanted to release this as a mini review so far, kind of a first impression so you get an idea of what I'm thinking right now. But of course I'm going to continue playing with it so that when I do my full review I can learn everything I can possibly need to know about it, if there's any updates or fixes because I think that's going to be very important for this particular device. I do see this device getting a little bit better of a handle on the battery life. I'm sure on my Google Plus page or on one of my other social media feeds I'm going to continue talking about this as I'm reviewing it, as I'm getting everything ready to do the final hour long review. So thank you everybody for watching. This has been Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Just know that I really do like this phone. I am quite excited to see eventually what we can get fixed for this poor little guy. Senior Kit Kat needs some love. It's an overall very nice little phone and you really can't beat it for the money. Don't dismiss him just yet. Have a good night, you guys.